Hi, welcome to the Bridge Podcasts. We hope you enjoy the following message. For more information on all that's happening at the Bridge Church, please visit www.bridge-church.com. Let's do something different. And uh, we've had Nancy come up and give us that great. How many of you think that was a great testimony? How many of you think it'd be even better if it happened to you? (laughs) I think it's awesome. Uh, Whenever I see the healing power of God work in someone's life, I know it reminds me of God's covenant. It reminds me that God watches over His Word to confirm it with signs following. And uh, uh, I've seen God do amazing things time and time and time again. And uh, He'll never stop doing amazing things and giving people testimonies. So this morning, I I want to ask Christine to come up and share with us for a few minutes her testimony. Uh, Christine uh, is uh, a special lady from, uh, we've only just met recently, and she's dressed like this because she comes in a scooter, uh, a, motorbike. a motorbike. So, uh, she's just going to just come over this way a bit so people can see you. And uh, uh, she was with my wife yesterday, that, and uh, she told my wife a story, which is awesome. So, <laughs> thank you. Please. Um, well, I don't know where to start, but. Uh, Let's say I was born in the east of, in Germany, and I lived in the east of Germany for Did you hold that up a bit? for a, for the rest of the, for the time until the wall came down. I was working in the forces, and uh, when the wall came down, I went to the police force in the west, and uh, I wrote software for managing personnel the personnel services so that each and every one would be able to be checked out where they were. And uh, driving from my headquarters to Berlin Airport, after done my job, I got noticed that I was going to be the head commander of the, well, let's say, about 8,000 people. And then I said, no, nothing can happen to me anymore. And, uh, well, it wasn't a Christian at that time, so I had on collision with someone who took the exit for the entrance on the motorway, ended up in the hospital for hmm, more than 14 months. So, you know, four months on intensive care, then you know in what situation I was in. And the first five days of I was, that I was after the accident, uh, I've seen, the only thing I remember of these five days is that I've seen doctors working on my body. I was leaving the, I was, could see it from above. So, and I wanted to turn to a very wonderful, comforting light behind me. And uh, someone stopped me and he said, it's not your time, you have to go back. So, well, I said, I've been on my own for as long as I'm on the road now. I don't want to go back on my own, so you have to come. And then he said, you have to invite me in. When you're back in your body, you can invite me in. So, well, after these uh, days of uh, that, I don't know what happened. So, there's five days that blackout. I don't know, except for this out-of-my-body experience. And then... The minute I opened my eyes, I invited Jesus in. And then he promised me he was going to heal me. At that time, I had lost all my teeth. And uh, except these. (laughs) And these saved me from breaking my neck. So they hung behind the steering wheel. And had the steering wheel in my my tummy. So... (laughs) I was in a very, very bad shape. 17 bones broken in my body, so that's not one bone broken, that's a lot of bones broken. And Jesus said to me, I'm going to heal you at my time. So, uh, months later, I came into a, a room with other people who were injured or were ill, 
and uh, I had to go to the revalidation. And one morning I went to the revalidation and I heard this voice saying, try to stand today. So I went in and walking, in, rolling in in my wheelchair. So coming in there and going to the bars and putting the caps up, putting my feet on the ground and hanging my arms over the bars and then pushing the button to go up. And the minute my body was lifted out of the chair, I felt the strength coming back into my legs. So and I told, oh, Lord, this is amazing. I'm so grateful for what you're going to do. But still, he kept me five years in a wheelchair. You can't imagine that now, don't you? <laughs> Standing in front of you. And, uh, well, I took, uh, in 1999, a uh, sister from church, here so there was a prayer meeting for healing, and she invited me to go over there. And that was something... The morning before we went, Jesus said to me, this is your day. So I'm going to do something special to you. And uh, I went in and uh, in church and, you know, in a wheelchair, we have a wheelchair over there. And, you know, it's not easy to get through a huge amount of people. You can get through there. So you have to stay in the back. And so that's what I did. And sitting in the back, this pastor comes to me and said, the Lord said to me, I have to pray for you. So come up front. So what do you do if you're ordered to go up front? I wasn't used to walk up front, so I set up the claps. You listen. So, and I can't remember touching the grounds from my wheelchair up to the front where he prayed for me and... Uh, when he prayed for me, I had this, I know what his sister was saying before, it's an amazing feeling, warm, comfortable, so wonderful, healing my body from there till there. So I started dancing. I didn't know, know how to deal with my joy. <laughs> so each and every one thought I was. <laughs> so, <clears throat> and I must say, ever since, I often wake up at night that the Lord is talking to me, then I have to read a piece of the Bible, and then he, explain, he asked me what, if I understand it. And I learned a prayer, which I want to share with you. I learned the prayer from Jesus, Lord, allow me to be a blessing. That's not something I demand, but it's allow me to be a blessing in your hands and in your kingdom. So... Praise God for who he is. And Jesus said someday, greater things than he will, we will do. So get ready for it. Amen. Amen. <laughs> when we believe God, there is nothing that God can't do for us in our life. Nothing. Um, uh, to, to be in a wheelchair for five years, to have all your uh, 17 bones smashed and your major bones in your body, and then to get out of a wheelchair, I think is, uh, it has to be God. It has to be God. It's a miracle. And uh, uh, so, uh, Christine obviously had um, a good mind to be able to make up programs and uh, for the police there in East Germany. So, we thank God for the covenant, and I just want to share for a few minutes today on the covenant of God, and uh, I'd like us just to uh, look at these scriptures in uh, Joshua uh, uh, chapter 1, verse 1, and uh, God did amazing things with His people, and uh, uh, the word says, after the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, it came to pass that the Lord spoke to Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' assistant, saying, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now, therefore, arise, go over this Jordan, you and all this people, to the land which I am given to them, the children of Israel. Let's just keep going. Uh, Every place that the sole of your foot will tread upon, I've given you, as I said to Moses. 
from the wilderness and this Lebanon as far as the great river, the river Euphrates, all the land of the Hittites and the, to the great sea towards the going down of the sun shall be your territory. Right up to verse 7. No man shall be able to stand before you all the days of your life. As I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will not leave you nor forsake you. Be strong and of good courage, for to this people you shall, you shall divide as an inheritance. You shall divide as an inheritance the land which I swore to their fathers to give them. Only be strong and very courageous that you may observe to do according to all the law which Moses, my servant, commanded you. Don't turn from it to the right hand or to the left, that you may prosper wherever you go. Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you for these great testimonies this morning. I thank you for the Holy Spirit doing his work here in this place today. Holy Spirit, I thank you for the anointing in this place today that breaks the yoke of bondage and sets the captive free for everyone that's in this place already. They have thought, I don't know what this is all about, but already they've thought, this is okay. So, Father, I thank you that you're working in lives and hearts and minds at this moment in time. Open the eyes of our understanding that they, be, they may be enlightened. Moses, my servant, is dead. That was the end of an era. Two and a half million people, the, 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 the students of the Bible say two and a half million people were moving from Egypt into the promised land. And uh, uh, Moses was given the job of leading those people. Moses lived as the son of Pharaoh for 40 years. He lived in Egypt. He had the best uh, that anyone could have in those days because he lived uh, with the richest man in the world at that time. He lived with uh, Pharaoh who ruled the world at that time. So, he, so he had, he had it all going on, and after 40 years, he sees some injustice. He sees uh, an Egyptian striking a, a, a slave, and Moses goes and kills a guy. I don't know if he meant to kill him. He probably just hooked him or something and the, hit him in the wrong place or something. Anyway, the guy died, and Moses had to flee, and he went uh, to live with Jethro for 40 years. While he was with Jethro, those 40 years, he married Zipporah, uh, Jethro's daughter, and had two children. Uh, so, after those 80 years, uh, that was only the start of his ministry, God sent him back to go to Egypt uh, and to tell Pharaoh, let my people go. And uh, that was the beginning of the next phase of his ministry. So, this is a story about transitioning. This is a story about moving forward. This is a story about uh, a change in the status quo. You know, the, the one thing about life is change is here to stay. If you haven't noticed it, change is here to stay. The, uh, the, the world that I live in today definitely the, isn't the world I was born into. Uh, where we had horses and, uh, and carts, and uh, that's the way it was. We went to the mill and put our corn in there, and it was turned into flour and all that sort of thing. My dad uh, worked as a plowman behind a horse, uh, and, and that's the way it was. We brought in the hay with horses, all that sort of thing. So, it's definitely not the world that I was born into, uh, outside facilities, toilet, bathroom, uh, no showers, no hot water, uh, all of that. We're, we're back to that place in our house. Our, our boil has been broken for 11 or 12 days already. But anyway, we're managing. So, <laughs> yeah, we might smell a bit, but <laughs> we're, we're, we're okay. We just use plenty of deodorant. <laughs> so, um, then Moses leads God's people through the wilderness, and of course, you all know the story that uh, uh, everyone over 20 years old died in the wilderness because of their unbelief. And uh, when, when Moses got to the border of the promised land, God took him on a walk 
and uh, he took him up to Mount uh, Pisgah uh, when he was 120 years old. The Bible says in Deuteronomy 34, 7, Moses was 120 years old when he died, yet his eyesight wasn't clear, and he was as strong as ever. So, uh, 120 years old, he was still, his natural vigor hadn't diminished. You can be vigorous at whatever age you want to be vigorous at. Amen. Amen. I know what age I'm going to stay around to because that's where I want to be. I don't want to live after a certain age because I had a mentor that lived uh, well into his 90s, and he says, the worst thing about living into your 90s is you have to bury your children. So, there's that kind of situation going on, uh, but he was still uh, strong, as vigorous as ever, but he knew he was going to die. He knew that was his last walk because God had already told him because of his disobedience and uh, because he allowed the people to persuade him to do something that God didn't want him to do, and he did it out of uh, a bit of anger. Uh, he needed anger management at that time, but anyway, it wasn't any counselors around. So, he, he struck a rock instead of speaking to the rock. He was supposed to speak to the rock and the water would come out, but because he got mad at the people, he struck it, and that's not what God said, you see. So, he should have done what God said. But anyway, one of the things that Moses did before he died, he reminded all the people what God had done for them. God wants His people reminded about His goodness. That's one of the reasons I had those two testimonies this morning is because God's a good God. And, and, and Psalm 27 uh, says, I would have lost heart if I hadn't seen the goodness of God in the land of the living. You see, it's the goodness of God that leads people to repentance. And uh, in Deuteronomy 5, you can see how uh, God reminded, He brought all these things back to the people. He, he, he reminded them that uh, they walked across the Red Sea and dry land. They, they went to the bitter waters of Mara, and they were made sweet, that they were fed daily. Two and a half million people, I read, and it took 4,500 tons of manna per day, four and a half thousand tons of manna per day. Two and a half million people is a lot of people, that's two and a half times the size of Glasgow, uh, to feed those people per day, uh, not counting the water, because if, if everybody drank three liters of water a day, that's uh, seven and a half, uh, uh, 750,000 cubic meters of water. That's a lot of water. It's enough to fill a dam, one of the small dams up there. Uh, do you know what I'm saying? It, and I've been in the area where they walked, and it's an arid land. There's, you just don't walk across uh, pools of water or, or, or big uh, lakes or anything. It's an arid land. So, God provided water for the families, and He reminded them of all these things. And the Bible says that uh, even with their 40 years in their wilderness, that not one of them had shoes that wore out, neither did their clothes wear out, neither was there any sick amongst them for 40 years. Isn't that what? So, he reminded the people of what he did for them over that period of time. So, anyway, <clears throat> we're moving into this transition, and God says, Moses, my servant, is dead. So, there's a time when things come to an end. And, 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 and he's saying, now, Joshua, you've been anointed. You've had hands laid on you. It's time for you to move. There, there, there's something you're going to do now. You've been a servant to a servant. Moses, my servant. You've been a servant to the servant. Now, you're going to be taking his place. And the only way that he could take his place is because he stayed around his master, who is a servant, all the time that his master did anything. 
Are you with me? So then Moses laid his hands on him, and that's what we call a transferring, a transference of the anointing. Uh, so the anoint, the same anointing that was on Moses, was placed on Joshua. You can have that same anointing when you receive a prophet as a prophet, you receive a prophet's reward. If you receive a pastor as a pastor, you receive the anointing that's on that pastor's life. Are you with me? That's the way God has, uh, has structured this. So, uh, he, God told Joshua what he needed to do, and uh, the first thing he says, you're going to cross the Jordan River. Well, the, the uh, they tell us that though in those days, it was a day of harvest, that the Jordan River was a mile wide. If any of you have crossed the Fourth Road Bridge, the Fourth Road Bridge is a mile long. So, can you imagine crossing a river that's a mile wide without a bridge? So, the first thing your senses say is, I don't think that's going to work. <laughs> no. I don't see how that can work. Hey, I think you're getting it wrong here. Josh, it's your first job, and you've made a mess of it. But God says to him, I promise you what I promised Moses. I promised you what I promised Moses. I promised you what I promised Moses. Let me tell you, those promises are generational. Abraham's promises, the promises God made to Abraham are still for us today. Abraham's blessings are ours. And he says, Where you, whatever you set your foot on land I have given you, uh, none will be able to stand against you. I will not fail you and I will not abandon you. Be strong and courageous. So, um, you see, we're, we're moving into a new season and and. Most of God's great opportunities turn up as inconveniences. Most of God's great opportunities turn up as an inconvenience in our life. I remember one time I, I, was, I was driving in, in South Africa. I was driving through this town called Ermelo. <clears throat> and as I, uh, I'd stopped for something to eat in a wimpy bar. They didn't have McDonald's or anything else in those days, of course. And uh, I stopped for something to eat, and I, I, just as I, I left, I heard a voice, just like Christine says, she heard a voice speaking behind her, and it, and it said, I want you to go and give this amount of money to a pastor's wife who's just, who, who's just started a new church in the town. <clears throat> and I'm like, well, Lord... I'm going, I'm going, I've got an appointment, and I don't have time. He says, you've got to do this. I want you to do this. So, I thought, well, how do I find the person? We didn't have mobies, okay? <laughs> we didn't have online web or anything like that. Do you get it? Uh, so, I'm like, uh, there's no way I can find this. So, I get in my car, and I'm driving out of Ermelo. I get to the sign that says, haste you back. Actually, it doesn't say that in Africa. It says, <laughs> and uh, so anyway, here I am, uh, and the, the Lord says, I told you to do that, so I turn, it's an inconvenience, so I turn around, and I go back to the wimpy bar, and I thought, where will I get information? So I go back there, and I go in, and I say to the cashier, I'm looking for somebody that started a new church in Ermelo. Ermelo is quite a big town. And the person says, oh, the, that woman that's coming out that door over there is the pastor's wife. So, I went out, spoke to her, gave her the money that she needed, started crying and everything, and she says, it's my uh, son's birthday today. I didn't have any money to buy him gifts now I can have a gift and we can have a party for the children. It was an inconvenience, but it was an opportunity, and we had uh, quite a lot to do with them after that. So, uh, Joshua's journey had similar experiences to Moses. Had, Moses had a Red Sea crossing. Joshua had the Jordan crossing. Moses had Aaron with him. Joshua had Caleb. 
and Caleb and Joshua were the only two survivors of their generation. And these were men of great faith, men who were not moved by what they saw, but what, by what God had spoken in His Word. Uh, in Numbers 13, 30, uh, and the New Living Testament, it says, but Caleb tried to quiet the people as they stood before Moses. Let's go up at once to take the land, he said. We can certainly conquer it. That is certain, we can certainly conquer it is a conclusion of faith. When you're in faith, there is a conclusion. And the conclusion of faith is based on what God's Word says. If God's Word says it, then the conclusion is uh, that's what will happen. And let's do what God says because that is definitely will, what will happen in our life. And, and verse 31 says, But the other men who had explored the land with him disagreed. We can't go up against them. They are stronger than we are. And that is the conclusion of unbelief. Yeah. We, uh, as long as you've got a T on can, you'll never get where you want to go in life. Uh, those that say they can and those that say they can't are both right. Uh, so, to walk in faith, you've got to take the T off of can't. I can do all things through God who strengthens me. Are you with me? Uh, so, uh, that's the conclusion of faith when you see uh, uh, those things the way God says it, not the way your natural eye sees it. Because if you're going to walk across a mile-wide river that's in torrent, your eyes say, and your senses are saying there is absolutely no ways. But you see here... Uh, what happened, uh, well, I'm going ahead of myself, but let me just finish where I was the, with the, the spies. Number 1333 says, we even saw giants there. We saw giants there, which is a fact. The descendants of Anak, next to them, we felt like grasshoppers, and that's what they thought too. And uh, uh, another version of the Bible, it says, there we saw the giants... Uh, the descendants of Anak came from the giants, and we were like grasshoppers in our own sight, and so we were in their sight. You see, when we get to a place of seeing ourselves as other seers, which we really don't know how others see us, we make uh, uh, we have opinions of what others see in us because of our insecurities or our poor self-image or whatever else it is. Uh, but if we have, uh, 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 we see ourselves the way God sees us, we see ourselves uh, through the eyes of faith, then we are made in the image and likeness of the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, we're not a grasshopper, we're not a worm, uh, but they, the, the, the conclusion of unbelief said they saw us as grasshoppers uh, and uh, first of all, this is, we were like grasshoppers in our own sight, and so we were in their sight. But that was totally wrong. It was a total wrong uh, conclusion. Uh, you see, because the people of the land that they were moving into were scared spitless. They couldn't even get enough saliva in their mouth to spit because they were so scared of the Israelites coming across because they'd heard the stories, uh, uh, Joshua 2, 9 to 11, and the NLT says, I know the Lord, this is the, the kings of the land that they were going into, uh, and this is Rahab that's speaking now, uh, because she's, she's a prostitute in Jericho. She has her business in the wall in Jericho, uh, the walls of Jericho, because we're going there now, and that's where they were going, were 16 feet high and seven feet wide. 16 feet high is, is, is almost as high as that beam going across there. But then there was another uh, eight-foot section on top, which would take it right to the apex of the roof here. So, that's how high the walls were, seven feet wide. Seven foot is like 
that much. So that's how wide they were. Uh, so they th they're not just going to fall down, but that she had a house in the wall. And uh, Joshua 2 9 says, I know the Lord has given you this land, she told them. We, and she knew the people in that area, especially the, the men, we are all afraid of you. Everyone in the land is living in terror. Well, I've never been terrified of a grasshopper. In fact, I drove through a, a swarm of grasshoppers or locusts. The two of them come from the same uh, family tree. And uh, the only problem they gave me was trying to scrape them off the car. So, otherwise, uh, they're, they're, they're harmless to humans, uh, except when they hit you in the eye and the face and everything else. Uh, and, and verse 10 says, For we have heard how the Lord made a dry path for you through the Red Sea, when you left Egypt, and we know what you did to Sihon and Og, the two Amorite kings east of the Jordan River, whose people you completely destroyed. No wonder our hearts have melted in fear. No one has the courage to fight after hearing such things, for the Lord your God is the supreme God of the heavens above and the earth below. So, the people were scared spitless. They, they, they knew they were coming. They didn't know how long it was going to take them, but God was preparing them for something. God, uh, after 40 years where the parents of all this, uh, these people had uh, died off and told them stories, God had to put faith back into His people. God had to show Himself strong in their behalf by doing these miracles. So, uh, when uh, the God had to take the people over the Jordan uh, so that they would place their complete trust in Him. So, God was looking to build the people's trust in Him up. You see, we don't trust in man. We trust in God. We trust in His Word. Amen. It's His Word that's the, uh, the Alpha and the Omega. It's His Word that is the yes and amen. It's His Word that we can't ch change one jot or tittle of because His Word is immutable. Are, are you with me? Uh, so, uh, uh, the first thing that God commanded after, now, is, is, is trying to build the trust in these people. The first thing God commanded after the crossing of the Jordan was for 12 men to take 12 stones from the river to the place where the priests feet stood firm. And the priests, Joshua commanded the priests to take the ark and walk into the river that was in Torrent. And they were to stand firm in that river. Uh, they were to take the step in faith before they, they saw the answer. Are you with me? The river was in Torrent, and they had to step into it. They had to take that step in faith. We got to take a step in faith. Sometimes it looks impossible, but when we take that step in faith, things that changes the circumstances. It, it puts heaven uh, at our disposal. It, it puts the angels uh, to work on our behalf. The angels, the Bible tells us, the angels are ministering spirit spirits for those who are heirs of salvation, okay? Uh, Hebrews 1.14 tells us that. So, when we do something in faith, it releases heaven to back it up. But well, we don't do anything, there's nothing to back up. Are you with me? So, uh, in Joshua 4, verse 6, it, the Bible says uh, to verse 9, we will use these stones to build a memorial. God is big on remembrance, you see, your faith is built up. Your faith will only be as strong as the remembrance you've got. Now, I can tell you that Christine and Nancy remember what happened. The same situation that was like hot, feeling heat uh, going over their bodies, and, and, and that healing came, and, 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 and Christine's situation, God spoke to her from behind the bed, said, I'm going to heal you. 
uh, you see, uh, but you've got to invite me in. So, there's something that she had to do, when, and when God said to her that day, stand, uh, uh, five years before she eventually did, she did what she was told. She was obedient to the Word. She could have said, well, I can't stand. Can't you see? But she did what she was told to do. Are you with me? So, when we follow the Word of God, so, uh, and, and God uh, builds a memorial or a remember. A memorial is something that we remember by, and it says, in the future, your children will ask you, what do these stones mean? You see, do your children ask you, what was it like in the old days? Uh, does your children ask you uh, where, your, where your parents came from? Do your children ask about their grandparents? Do your children ask why you believe the way you believe? Or do your children think the way you believe is, is, is crazy? It's not relevant for today. If there's anything that's relevant for today, it's, it's, it's having a, an anchor in the truth, it's not going to move. The anchor is going to remain there. It's the un immutable, un un uh, unmovable rock uh, of the Lord Jesus Christ. So, uh, the world is changing so much um, uh, that, that finance could be, uh, you know, China's now in trouble. There's so much happening in the economy again. It's like, we got to have if we don't understand that God will supply all our need according to His riches and glory, then uh, where, where, where will you get your supply from? Will you be able to cross your Jordan? Will you be able to get over that insurmountable problem that you seem to have in your life? No, if, if you have a memorial, if you have remembrance of what God's done, even if it hasn't happened to you, that you read it and believe it and speak it, the Bible says in verse 7, then you can tell them, they remind us that the Jordan River stopped flowing when the ark of the Lord's covenant went across. These stones will stand as a memorial among the people of Israel forever. So the men did as Joshua had commanded them. They took 12 stones from the middle of the Jordan, one for each tribe, just as the Lord had told Joshua. They carried them to the place where they camped for the night and constructed a memorial there, Joshua also set up another pile of 12 stones in the middle of the Jordan, the place where the priests who carried the Ark of the Covenant were standing. You see, God said, I'm going to place a memorial where people stood. The Bible says in Ephesians 6, when you have done all else, stand. Stand, dressed in the armor of God, but there's a place in your life where you've got to stand, where you've got to stay. I will not move. I will not budge. I am the healed of the Lord Jesus Christ. I have a future. I have a hope. We will not go under for going over. We, we will do what we can do. Amen. So, God has a purpose, and that's why uh, God brought them. You see, uh, uh, when, when the kings of the Amorites heard that the Lord had dried up, it says this in Joshua 5, 1, uh, they heard that the Lord had, when all the kings of the Amorites who were on the west side of the Jordan, all the kings of the Canaanites who were by the sea, heard that the Lord had dried up the waters of Jordan, from before the children of Israel until we had crossed over, that their heart melted and there was no spirit in them any longer because of the children of Israel. I want to say God is always changing us into His plan. God is always changing us into His plan. God wants to get us to a place where we walk with assurance, walk with a a, 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 an assertiveness because we know God. The Bible says in Daniel eleven thirty two 32 that those who know God will be strong and do exploits. 
So God wants us to be people of exploits. He wants us not to be the ones that are um, always on the back foot. He wants us to be overcomers. He wants us to be victorious. He wants our children to be uh, victorious. He wants our families. You see, Rahab said to the spies when they came in, ah, hey, I'll do this for you if you do that for me. I'll protect you if you will protect me and all my family and all their, all their uh, sheep, their cattle, and everything else. And, and the spies said to her, if you hang this, gold, uh, this uh, scarlet thread out of the window when we come, and historically it's shown, they've already seen this from the space satellite, the, the, the foundations of Jericho, and they've seen that the foundations of Jericho didn't f- collapse outward or didn't collapse inward, they collapsed on themselves. It's a scientific, it's a, 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 a scientific fact. So, scientists have, have seen that, that, and the only one place that was left standing was Rahab's. Wow. Uh, you, you see, that's a memorial. So, so, God wants you and your household, everyone that will come in, and all their cats, all their dogs, all their sheep, all their cows, whatever they have, is going to be saved also. Are you with me? I'm trusting that God's Word is inspiring faith in you to do and today. Listen to this, and just I'll close with this in Ephesians chapter 1. In Ephesians chapter 1, The Bible says this, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. So, He has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. So, that means that when we come to Christ, He blesses us when you're blessed, it's something that you don't deserve. It's something that you're given. Uh, you're blessed with every spiritual blessing. So, you're blessed to walk in holiness. You're blessed to walk in righteousness. You're blessed to walk in these things. Every spiritual blessing that you need for success while you're on the earth has already been given to you. But if that, that's a lot, but it's not everything, because in verse 11, it says, in whom we have obtained an inheritance, being predestined according to the purpose of Him who works all things according to the counsel of His will, that we who first trusted in Christ should be to the praise of His glory. We are inheritors. We are part of the inheritance of the Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 11, would you put that up? Ephesians 1.11. I want you to see that. You have an inheritance in Him. In who? In Christ. In Christ also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestined according to the purpose of Him who works all things according to the counsel of His will. How, How many of you know if you had an inheritance, if you had a rich uh, uncle uh, from Dunfermline, uh, and his name was Carnegie, uh, and he passed on, you wouldn't, you wouldn't sleep at night trying to find out if you were part of his inheritance. Are you with me? Uh, you'd want to know what your inheritance was. There's a story of a, a, a lady. Uh, she had worked as a servant in a big house for many years, and uh, the wife of the household had died. Uh, all the f- there was no children, and the, the husband was old, and she cared for him until he eventually passed. And uh, after he passed, the lawyers gave her a piece of paper, which she took, and she framed and put on her wall. And uh, uh, she was an, an ignorant person. She, she wasn't educated, 
So eventually, uh, she, was, she was sick at home and eventually passed. And when they came and found her body there, they found on, uh, and she lived in poverty, they found on the, will, on the wall framed the last will and testament of this man that died, leaving everything to her. She had an inheritance, but she didn't know she had it. You see, that would be the worst thing that could happen in your life. You could be living in penury, but yet there's an inheritance waiting for you. And unless you claim it, uh, you know, there's these, uh, uh, I've seen it on the telly, these will, uh, what is it, what do you call it? Air hunters. I thought you said it, hair hunters. <laughs> so he's cheeky. So, <laughs> now I'm having trouble saying air. <laughs> <laughs> so they have people that are just looking for people that have a, an inheritance, but they don't know it. Do you know what I'm saying? So, we know that we have an inheritance. In fact, when we gave our lives to Christ, we became sons of the Lord. So, we, we, we didn't just become heirs, we became sons. We became part of the forever family of God. So, that is awesome news. So, God wants you to know these things so that you uh, are built up in your inner man, and then you can start speaking to these things and say, I have an inheritance. I'm more than a conqueror in Christ Jesus. Jesus died on the cross so that I could overcome in the evil day so that I could do all things, not because of who I am, but because of Christ in me. So, we have an unfair advantage in the world today because we can say to the mountain of adversity in our life, we could say to those things that are trying to uh, stop us from getting to the most important inheritance that we have, and that is spending eternity with our Father God in heaven. So, that's why Jesus died for us, to build us in our faith. But, and that faith comes by hearing. How many of you have more faith now than you had when you came in today? Uh, your faith has been built up. You, you, you've heard testimony of people. Uh, you've, you, you've, you've seen what God has done, and you've heard His Word. Now, God just spends, uh, got this whole book for you so that you would, when you read it, your faith would be built up and you'd be able to uh, run at the giants. You wouldn't see yourself as a grasshopper. You'd see yourself as an overcomer. Amen. Thanks for listening. Remember to visit our website, www.bridge-church.com and connect with us via Facebook and Twitter. Thank you.